to welcome you this morning in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So would you please join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, the sunshine, the beauty of the day. Father, just fill our hearts today with your Holy Spirit, Spirit to celebrate just the beauty of the works of your hands, all the joys and things that you have given to us in our lives, and most importantly, God, the hope that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in our faith to serve you daily, to keep our eyes focused upon you, celebrating, Father, your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few quick announcements and one correction from last week. First off, thank you for all the, uh, all the kind comments last Sunday for um, Rachel and my 25th wedding anniversary. But I, I got to come clean. It was actually Tuesday of last week. But Kristen Kirsten Nelson was last Sunday. And nobody was saying anything to them. Kirsten wouldn't talk to me all week. She's like, whatever, take my thunder. So anyway, all right, we, gotta, we owe it to them. But to also want to congratulate Joe and Chris Veneer. 50 years they celebrated yesterday. So congratulations. Joe told me it's been the best 18 years of his life. No, Chris, he actually said 45. So you guys can figure out that five-year window. A uh, few other announcements. No ladies' prayer coming up this Tuesday. Um, but uh, ladies at 10 o'clock Tuesday mornings every week, uh, they do. Uh, ladies from the church will get together and have prayer. So if you want to just take part of that and be around some of your fellow sisters in prayer and spend time together, that happens uh, usually most Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock here at the church. And lastly then, in the back, uh, I've seen some of you grab some of these in the table. There are some devotionals for 9-11. Uh, we have the 20-year anniversary coming up. I think it's next Saturday is the 11th. And so 20 years since that event happened. And it's interesting having kids in school because they read about it in the history book. But looking around, I mean, a lot of us are not going to forget that day in those days. And so a wonderful devotional book in the back for you to take home and help yourself to those. Let's start off now by singing our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Friends, one of the things we do praise God for is his goodness and mercy, that we can come to him as sinners, confessing our sins, but yet relying on his promise of forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. And so it is together we go before him, 
confessing our sins and reading, I, a poor, miserable sinner, born of the sinful human race, confess unto you, holy and righteous God, that I have not loved you above all things, nor my neighbor as myself. Against your holy will have I transgressed by thought, word, and deed, and have therefore deserved eternal condemnation. But you, Heavenly Father, has promised to forgive those with penitent hearts, and believing in Jesus Christ, seek refuge in your fatherly compassion, relying upon your promises, I confidently beseech you to be merciful unto me, and to forgive me all my sins, to the praise and glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, if this be your sincere confession, and with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all your sins. And so through the authority of God's word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you that God, through his grace, has forgiven all your sins. In the name of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's invite up Kyle now for our scripture reading. morning. Uh, please join me in a word of prayer. <laughs> Lord, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to come here today and worship you, and we can all be here. And I just pray that we'd uh, hear the message the pastor has to bring today and uh, apply it to our lives this week. In your name, amen. Our gospel reading today is going to be from Matthew 25. Verses 14 through 30, Matthew 25, 14 through 30, reading in Jesus' name. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded them and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the one talent went and dug the, in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what's yours. But the master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then our epistle reading is going to be from Colossians um, 3. 
18 through 25. Colossians 3, 18 through 25. Again, reading in Jesus' name. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality. Uh, please join me in reading the uh, Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God and God, light and light, very God and very God, begotten not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time to come before you confessing our sins, confessing our faith, singing your praises. Father, thank you for this time to be together as an act of worship to you, lifting you up and praising your holy name. May your spirit continue, Lord, to work in our hearts, in our minds, growing us, and drawing us closer to you. 
to live our days with our eyes fixed upon the hope given to us through your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. A few weeks back, I had hired a handyman. I gave him a list of jobs to do. And on the list, he only completed numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7. I guess he only does odd jobs. <laughs> so, uh, I used to have a side job as a tailor, but it really wasn't suited for me, and the work was just so-so. <laughs> but Andy Peterson's just taking crazy notes right now. He's like, oh, these are good. <laughs> People are often shocked when they find out what a bad electrician I am. <laughs> I like that one, come on. I got a commerce degree and then I tried my luck as an investment banker. It was a fun gig, but then I lost interest. Uh, there was one time I had this job interview and the employer interviewing me said to me, he said, for this role, we need a candidate who will be responsible. And I said, hey, I'm your man, because at my last job, every time something went wrong, they said, Dave, you're responsible. <laughs> so there was this man that was walking down the road, and he was robbed, and he was beaten, and he was left bleeding, and a psychologist sees him, and he rushes over and says, goodness sakes, whoever did this really needs some help. <laughs> I have this hilarious joke about a courier, but I'm afraid you may not get it. Uh, uh, uh. So we were like, I don't get it. <laughs> I once worked at an elevator company, but the job had its ups and downs. As I get older, I think about all the people that I've lost along the way. And then I realize maybe a career as a tour guide wasn't for me. <laughs> I didn't think my chiropractor was very good. However, now I stand corrected. All right, last one. I like this one. This one, you got to pick up on. This one was good. Andy's like, don't be done yet, please. <laughs> I've decided to quit my job as a personal trainer because the weights were too heavy. I'm going to hand in my two-week notice. <laughs> that was really good. Right? I like that one. Please rise for our scripture reading this morning. <laughs> Our sermon text this morning is going to come from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. This ends our scripture reading. You may be seated. So I figured I'd start the sermon on a, on a lighter topic today, because our, our message this morning is going to be somewhat lighter as well, in the fact that the purpose of our message today is maybe to help us understand a bit, what is our place in the world? Not that I'm up here saying I have all the answers. I mean, that's like a lifelong question that philosophers and scholars have been trying to figure out, right? It's like we've always battled that as human beings, plagued by that question of what is the purpose of life? And if you've ever yourself wrestled with that question, what is the purpose of life, I'd actually encourage you, pick up your Bible, go read in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's such an incredible book that kind of helps us understand our place in the world and in life because it's written by King Solomon, the, the wealthiest of all kings in Israel's history, maybe the wealthiest king that's ever lived. And not, on, not only does he have this immeasurable amount of wealth, but he asked God for wisdom, and God gave it to him. So now he has this wisdom beyond all kinds of wisdom. And so in this immeasurable wisdom and wealth, Solomon came to find this, that man can never be happy in the world. We will chase, and we will chase. We will pursue after all of these different venues, and yet we will always come away with a void. 
And so how do you think Solomon's discovery of that in realizing that it's all for nothing, it's all going to lead you to nothing, how do you think that plays into, say, our, our culture of consumerism? Where we want more because we get this little sense of fulfillment anytime we acquire something, only a short while later, though, we're left wanting more again. Or how do you think his realization plays into our ever-growing culture of populist thinking? Where we, we place a savior in the rhetoric that our populist propaganda will produce and it makes us cling to the ideologies it spews. The problem is, it's actually what's creating all the problems for us. Or how do you think Solomon's discovery plays into our own lives where we try to make ourselves good enough for God so we create these own rules that we have to follow so that we can earn a right standing before God. It makes him happy with us because we live our own personal standards. But then that just makes us more rigid and more condemning of everybody who doesn't do it the same way that we do. And eventually it imprisons us and creates this joyless relationship with God. Notice the bleak turn this all took. We start off with some corny jokes, and then we go into this just bleak outlook on life. But guess what? That's a prime example of what life is. That's what the pursuit of life looks like. You're going to have highs, you're going to have lows, and you don't know when they're going to happen. That is the futility that we will all go through when we seek after the good life. Because you don't know what tomorrow holds. You know what holds right now, but you don't know what tomorrow holds. Even if you could, by the way, live the best life now. Let's say you could somehow get this great life and sustain it all throughout. Really, what have you gained? At best, you could say, I enjoyed life while others suffered. It's kind of a selfish thought, isn't it? And then to get even more bleak on top of that, even if you live the best life now, the reality is, and we all know it, death is a guarantee for all mankind, and then what? Nothing. The reality is this should create a nihilistic outlook in us. What's the point to any of this? I mean, really, what's the point to any of this? Believe it or not, friends, we can actually find purpose. We can find meaning. You may cringe at this answer, but it's found in our work. And that probably is a cringeworthy statement to say it's found in our work. I think I, I read a great comment about work one time. And this really kind of sums up how we view work. And this person said this, the two worst feelings in life are not having a job and having to go to work. <laughs> But in all reality, what we mean by that is our purpose, friends, is found in this. Our purpose is found in the work that we are doing here on this earth for our home that is in heaven. So I want to go down the sermon text this morning and look at what Solomon was talking about as we try to understand work and our place in all of this and what we gain from this and how this gives us purpose and meaning as we look forward to a Labor Day weekend where we celebrate labor. So first off, when you, when you looked at this text that, that we read in our sermon text when Solomon was asking all of these questions about work, what jumped out to me right off the bat was Solomon off the bat even hits on that deep issue that we are always going to feel and struggle with. Why it always feels in life like we are constantly searching for answers. Why we don't feel like we can ever get there. Why I've never arrived. Verse 9, I mean, this is almost the definition of nihilism. What gain has the worker from his toil? Really, what gain do we have in anything that we do? What I'm, I'm talking about like a true gain. Because even as every day we go about life and we get caught up in the humdrum monotony of life, just doing the same kinds of things, the fact that we're always busy, the reality is what do you have to show for it? What do I gain from all of this toil? But our answer is found in the next verse. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You see, some of the busyness that we have in our lives, friends, God created for us to keep us busy in doing things. Some of it is necessary. If you've had kids, raised kids, gone through the kid process, you understand those 18 years are the definition of busyness. It's insane. Plus, on top of that, we just have the daily affairs of life that keep us busy. You've got 
cleaning, cooking, jobs, I mean, all the kind of stuff that we have to do that keeps us busy, it is necessary and it's important. It's not a bad thing. And as a matter of fact, I think what Solomon was starting to say in verse 11 there can even help us when the monotony of life is wearing at us a little bit. When he says he has made everything beautiful in its time. Maybe next time you're lamenting the monotony of life, stop and see the beauty in it. Because the reality is, any of us that, that remember from our time, anybody that's currently in the process of raising kids, you understand there's times you're like, I cannot wait till they hit 18 and they're out of here. But any of you that have kids that are out of the house now, how much do you miss those days? And even now that I have, you know, obnoxious, snotty teenagers, uh, <laughs> I, j I remember the times, one of my favorite moments. We're sleeping on the couch and your kids are laying in your chest when they're little infants and they're sleeping there. I mean, those are like the greatest moments you can remember. And so we get, instead of getting caught up in the monotony of things, why not say he has made everything beautiful in its time and remember the beauty of the moment that we're in. Not remembering all the, the monotony and the boredom of it, the busyness of it. Because as, we, as the expression goes, you, know, you don't know what you got until it's gone. See the beauty in those things. But you know, it's one thing to go through like our busy lives and start seeing the beauty in it, and that's a great place to be, but it still does not address that feeling of emptiness that we get out of life. Like we're, we're why is it I'm constantly busy, but I'm not actually feel like I'm achieving anything? Why don't I actually have anything? Why does it feel like life sometimes you're just spinning your wheels and getting nowhere? And the bad news is, friends, we will never have an answer to that on this earth. You see, Solomon went on to say this in verse 11. Also he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We all have that eternity in our hearts, that longing for that eternal home to which we truly belong. That longing is there that we know that there is something greater out there awaiting us, and as long as we're here, we are never going to have that. Nothing in this world will ever satisfy you like your heavenly home will satisfy you. And the writers of the epistles knew that very well. They wanted us to, to understand that a bit. The author of Hebrews described things this way in Hebrews 13, 14. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp, bear the reproach he endured, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We have no lasting city here. We seek for that is to come. Everything here is temporary, but everything we look forward to is eternal. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That's why we have this longing in us. Peter actually describes us as sojourners in this world. We're aliens here. We're exiles. We don't belong here, my friends. This is not our true home. So this longing that we have in us will never truly be satisfied until we are all together, worshiping the Lord in the new heaven, the new earth, not floating on clouds with a mini harp. That is not the description of Scripture. Physical bodies in the new earth where everything has been made right, all the stuff that makes life bleak and difficult is gone. That's when we'll be fully satisfied. So now that we know this, what do we do with it, right? If my time on earth seems pointless and empty, well, that doesn't sound like what God created us for. So instead, let's look at what our purpose is here on this earth. Because in that, we can find some semblance of meaning until the Lord calls us to our eternal home. So in verse 12 through 13, Solomon wrote this. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Eat, drink, work well. This is all a gift from God. But you hear right before that gift, he describes it all. When he says that we should be joyful and do good to all. Now, in hearing this, though, you've just got Solomon saying, we should eat, drink, take pleasure in our toil. This is God's gift to man. But yet we describe how all that is empty and meaningless. How do the two come together? 
The way we can find joy and purpose and meaning in that is first off, when we don't make that our objective. When our objective is simply eat, drink, and be merry, then we're going to be unhappy in life because you can never have enough of anything and the emptiness is going to come in. But the second reason that we can hear this, eat, drink, and enjoy your toil, and know that this is from God, is again when he says, be joyful and do good. Because in that now we are doing kingdom work. And our eyes are focused on the kingdom, and the kingdom of God is what's eternal. Thus, everything has weight and merit and value to it, as opposed to being temporary. Solomon went on to say, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. You see, everything that we do for the Lord has an eternal implication to it. Which means it endures forever. Notice now your work suddenly has value and has meaning because it lasts forever. These are all the works that God has created us to do in Christ. And all of a sudden then you're no longer toiling for mundane details of life. You're doing what's for God's kingdom, which is an eternal kingdom. And if you're scratching your head thinking to yourself, well, pastor, when you, when you talk about doing work for the kingdom, I'm not a pastor, that's your job. Or if you're thinking to yourself, well, but I, I'm not called to do ministry. Friends, the title of our sermon today is One Job, Two Kingdoms, because it doesn't matter what your vocation is, whether you're a pastor, youth leader, whether you're a missionary, none of that stuff matters. What matters is the one job that you have which is the same for both kingdoms. All believers in Jesus have one job that serves both kingdoms. Because our faith in Jesus, which makes us citizens of our eternal kingdom, all those who have their faith in Jesus that he will return again one day, that trust in his blood of having cleansed us from our sins, we are people awaiting our heavenly kingdom, but until we get there, we understand that here on our earthly kingdom it is to glorify God. If you have a place in God's kingdom, your calling here on this earth is to build up this kingdom for the glory of God's kingdom. And there's multiple ways that we are called to go about in doing this. It has everything to do with your approach in life and the character you exhibit that it reflects the character of God. So let's look overall at the characteristics of God then that we should have in our daily responsibilities because that's what this is all about is showing God's character for his glory. Because there's many areas in our lives, friends, where we have responsibilities. That's our labor. That's our job. When we talk about job and work for kingdom, it doesn't just mean people that are in ministry. It means in all things that we have responsibilities for, how are we conducting and carrying ourselves? I want to go to our epistle reading then from Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting of the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. You see all these things? These are part of our daily responsibilities. The roles that we have in all of that. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And I get that doesn't play well in our current culture, right? But that's not a right understanding then. The right understanding of the call for wives to submit to your husbands is for the sake of the unity of the marriage. It's for the sake of the whole. Stop and look at the Trinity. You've got Jesus submitting to the will of the Father. The Trinity is three distinct persons, all equally God, all in, a un in unity and function of the Trinity. So their submission is not a form of inferiority, which is, again, the misconception we have about submitting. I always like to say, actually, the one that submits is actually the bigger person. Because in a relationship when you are willing to submit, that takes the greatest level of self-assuredness. That takes the greatest recognition of it's about the whole and the responsibility of the whole. It's about serving the purpose of the whole, not our own individual desires. 
And so the call for wives to submit to your husbands is then followed up with husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Right there, that should say any thought of superiority of man over his wife should be thrown away. Because husbands, it is not saying you are superior to your wives. She doesn't submit to you because you are above her as in the superior being. She doesn't do it out of your dominance. She does it out of the trust that you have her best interest in mind. The exact same thing comes up in the next two verses when it talks about children submitting and obeying your parents. For this pleases the Lord. You see, it's the same principle. The one that is called to be the head of the household, the one that is called to be a head of anything, it is your responsibility not to lord over it, but provide for the well-being of it. That is the submitting that you are doing. It's called servant leadership. You lead through serving. This is, as Christians, how we are called to carry ourselves, to lead through serving. We are called to carry ourselves with excellence. We are called to lead with excellence. And what do you do that in excellence? How do you lead and serve with excellence when those above you are not of excellent character? Paul starts kind of addressing that. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. This is the part that's most important for us. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive inheritance as your reward. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Do you understand why we work how we do? It is for the Lord. It is what the Lord has instructed us to do. Not for ourselves, not for our gain, but working for the Lord. That's why we serve with the best ability, remembering again. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as your reward. And he goes on to say again, you are serving the Lord Christ. Does that not just change your whole outlook on your job and on your responsibilities in life? You are serving the Lord Christ. Paul's direct words right there. And he says with that, by faithfully doing that, God will give you a good reward. You know, Paul in saying what he just wrote right here in Colossians was so important to him, he wrote almost verbatim this same thing in Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. And it's so funny because it's so contrary to what the world tells us. Here's Paul reiterating in a couple different letters our call to serve faithfully even to those who have authority above us to serve with excellence because we are doing it for the Lord. Yet our current culture and society says, you know what? If somebody above you is a hoser or your boss is or something like that, you've got to stick it to the man and we all celebrate that, right? Isn't that great? But the thing is, that's not what we're called to do. Whether the world celebrates that or not doesn't change the fact that Scripture calls us to this. 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Remember, Peter's reminder there. You don't belong in this earth. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. See, it's our flesh that says, I want to lash up. It's our flesh that says, nobody tells me what to do. It's our flesh that says, I will show them. But instead, Peter tells us to abstain from that type of thinking. And he says instead to keep our conduct honorable because it brings glory to God. Friends, that is our one job that we have in the two kingdoms, and that is to give glory to God. My time in this kingdom on this earth is to give glory for the God who serves in his kingdom of which he has promised me I will be a citizen of through my faith in Jesus Christ. And we can't deny that we have that little voice in us. I get it. When we really don't like someone, we don't like the way somebody does something, we don't want to do what's best for them, right? Do it anyway. Do it anyway because that's what we are called to do as Christians. Do it anyway because of this. In Hebrews 6, 10 through 12. For God is not, so, is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving all the saints as you still do. 
And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Do you hear everything that is in there? God doesn't overlook your work. When you have to endure for the sake of somebody, but you are enduring because your hope is in Christ and you realize my hope is not in this kingdom, but it's in the kingdom to come. God sees that, does not overlook that, and he rewards that. There is that promise there of that. God sees and rewards you when you, see, when you just you smile, but really you're gritting your teeth really hard, and you're dealing with those people you can't understand and those situations that drive you nuts, and the only way you're getting through it is you're thinking to yourself, Jesus, I'm doing this for you and your glory. I've never done that, obviously. Uh, but that's the stuff that he sees and recognizes because you're saying, God, this kingdom is not my kingdom. I want to bring glory to your kingdom. And so if I have to endure for the sake of your kingdom to give you glory, thus I will. Friends, a reminder again that our work is not in vain. Just as it said in, in uh, Hebrews right there, Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, hear this promise again. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Isn't it nice to know that on those days that you can't take it anymore, you can honestly see a verse like this and say, thank you, God, that what I'm doing for your kingdom is not in vain, that you see this, you are pleased by this, that it gives you glory. And knowing that and understanding that, seeing something like verse 58 and those promises that we have, it doesn't make the problems in life go away, but it sure makes them a whole lot bearable because we have a purpose for why we do it. God has called us to it, and he sees it, and it does not go in vain. And that's probably one of the problems I have with the, the mindfulness movement that everybody tells today is such a great thing, right? Because the mindfulness movement would tell you the same type of a thing, right? We tell you to endure the same way. Put on a happy face, right? Don't let others control your emotions. No one can hold you down. But where it falls short is what about those days when you simply can't take it anymore and you want to snap? Or those days that you do snap? Now what? But you see, friends, the promises that we have in Scripture is what's different than that. Because, we're, well, I have to try to be better for my own sake. No, this says you are better because God has promised you he will see and reward you for being better for his kingdom's sake. It's for his glory that we do these things. That's why we endure. So what does this look like then, friends? You don't have to be in a professional ministry to serve God. That's not what this is about. If you want to serve God, then know your one job. That is, do the best that you can do to build up his kingdom. In whatever situation, whatever is around you, godly character that reflects on God. Basically, the question becomes, when you enter a room, do you leave it in better condition than when you came in? Or does the room get better after you leave? That's kind of a problem, right? But when you come into things, do you make it better because it brings glory to God? Do you do everything to the best of your ability? Are you dependable? Are you trustworthy? Are you honorable? We're supposed to be these things. If your goal in life is to get through life looking out for number one, then you're falling short of our goal in life is supposed to be the best you that God has created you to be. And what I mean by that is he has created you to be his workmanship in Christ to do the good works that he has prepared for you to do. It doesn't necessarily mean you're a missionary or a pastor or whatever. It means that everything you do, you do for the glory of the Lord. Because if you recall from our gospel reading this morning, and Jesus describing the parable of the talents, you've been given gifts, every single person here, no matter how young, no matter how old, you have been given gifts in a reason and a way that you can serve in the kingdom. How do you want to serve? Do you want to serve just by burying those talents? Do you want to serve by binging on Netflix? I don't read of a lot of heavenly rewards for that. And re what I hear constantly is being the best you that God created you to be because it's for his kingdom. God has created you to be a light in a dark world. He's created you to stand out reflecting his character, giving him the glory he deserves. Friends, that 
is our purpose in life, and that's a life that has a purpose. Please bow your heads to me in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do wander through this life, struggling at times to find our meaning, our purpose, wondering why there's always that feeling of emptiness at times. That no matter how hard we try and work at something or accomplish things, we're never quite fully satisfied. It's because, Lord, you have put in us that understanding of eternity, that understanding that this world is not our hope. This world is temporary. That this is just the first kingdom we live in as we look forward, Father, to being with you in your kingdom forever. And so, God, fill us then with your Holy Spirit. Help us to find the gifts that you have given to us to serve you and to bring you glory. To build up your eternal kingdom, God. To give us value in our work and meaning. Because the work that we do for that Heavenly Father, that has eternal value. Let that lead and guide us in all that we do. For that we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, you know, the reason we have the hope of that eternal kingdom is because of what Jesus has done for us. Because we have separated ourselves from that kingdom. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God sent his son to come down and die for us. And in that, he gave us the new covenant in his body and his blood. And as we receive that today, know that. That you in your life are called to serve and glorify a God who came down to this earth to die for your sins. That through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, you now have the hope of living in that eternal kingdom. Of serving in that eternal kingdom, worshiping God there forever. The kingdom the way it was supposed to be. Friends, I'd ask you to join me now as together we say the prayer that the Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. When he had eaten and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. My friends, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Now take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction of all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Friends, let us rise and sing our closing hymn when we all get to heaven.
give thanks and pray. We thank you, almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. We ask for your infinite mercy, strengthen our Christian faith, support us in the trials of life, and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.